Hello, good morning, and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering motivation on your Monday morning, rise and shine and give God the glory. And this morning here, our topic is why blood, sweat, tears for positive change. Why blood, sweat, and tears for positive change. This is what we're going to be exploring this morning here as we look at um, how to move forward and how to um, gain some successes. So why blood, sweat, and tears for positive change? So welcome again to our live talk program and hopefully you had a blessed night rest. And thanks again for stopping by here with me this to share your morning with me. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, again for your love towards us and um, your willingness, dear Lord, um, to send your son to die for us and to uh, really give blood, sweat, and tears for us, dear Lord. I pray, dear Lord, that you may bless us as we learn of thee, dear Lord, and accept of thee the things that are needed for our well-being and for our salvation. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So why is it um, that in order for there to be positive change on a personal level, on a family level, on a national, global level, why, why does it take blood, sweat, and tears? Why does it take the blood? Why is it the Bible talk about the blood of the martyrs? Mm -hmm. Why is that the reality? Why is something else not a reality? And so we want to kind of explore this here this morning as we look at this um, a thing that is important for us, especially as I say on a personal level, level because each person has to make up their minds as to how they live their life and um how they um you know move forward their lives and as this is just part of um my i guess um you know musing about you know why why is this why is this the uh, the blood of the saints the blood of the martyrs why is this a, a thing and so in hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 we start off talking about that here it says and Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. There's no payment, removal, dealing with sin. So normally it takes blood. And as we look at in our society here, we see that although Christ died for the sins of this world, uh, it still doesn't change the reality that the wages of sin is dead. And normally that dead is looked upon as the shedding of blood so that's something that we always have to deal with um and um as we deal with this it, it the reality is that most naturally we can accept christ or we can continue on that way where we either learn to accept that sacrifice in our stead or we go ahead and allow ourselves to suffer the end result of not being able to live by faith but ultimately, as we know, that the blood of the um, of Christ cleanses it from all sin. Yeah, but the question again still is, why blood? Why sacrifice? Why this has to be the way to deal with sin? And as you look at what Christ did, both from a sacrificial point of view that he paid for our sins and from the way he lived and just his death in general, you realize that that's just the way it goes when you want change. It doesn't come easy. There's something about the sinful nature in human beings that it makes it that we have to go so hard in order to effect a change. Uh, you, you, you just don't get changes. So what I'm talking about again, personal life in our society. When the society is going down, normally you need somebody to, um, you know, there need to be shedding of blood. There need to be somebody put out a sacrifice in the sense of they give up something. Um, somebody need to sweat over it, somebody need to cry tears over it. It needs to be something that is really a, a, an effort that is, um, you know, coming from the depths of one's heart for one to get change. And when I'm talking about change, I'm not talking about like painting over a wall. We're talking about massive social change, both in society and in our personal life for there to be real effective change blood set and sacrifice has to be brought forward if you notice when christ called his disciples he says you know when somebody say i want to follow christ christ says if a person want to follow me they have to deny themselves pick up their cross and follow him and why such a methodology you know a person say i want to join a club so to speak or i want to join a church 
And you say to them, well, yeah, you can join. We welcome you in this church, in this church but we want you to um, follow us as we follow the master. And so what is that? Um, you're going to have to deny yourself. Well, that's going to cause some pain. Um, that's going to cause some tears at times. And you're going to have to pick up your cross. Well, that's definitely his blood. And that is some serious sacrifice, some serious sweating. And um, that too also is going to be some tears. And this is just the only method. So why this method? And I really believe this method is, is the way it is because of sin. Is there something about sin that it takes um, some real pain, more pain you feel of the sin and then pain you're going to feel trying to break um, free from that to get loose. And it's either going to be, if it's spiritual, um, going to be Christ's sacrifice or it's going to be you're going to have to make some sacrifice. But changes just don't come easily. And as I'm here doing motivation, you know, I, I want to see you successful. I want to be successful. And I look at it and I realize in order for you to change uh, a direction, a course, something has to be sacrificed because there's something that you're investing in. There's something that you do time-wise that has to be given up. You know, if you say, you know, look, I want to be healthier. And you say, well, what are you going to do? Um, you're going to have to uh, sacrifice time. You're going to have to sacrifice um, certain foods, you're going to have to sacrifice, um, you know, comfort, you're going to have to sacrifice some things in your schedule. Something has to change, something has to give for there to be a removal of something bad. That's just what it is. And so in Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17, verse um, 6, it says, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So this is talking about the dark ages. And this is talking about here. This is the Bible. John predicted what will happen in, um, in with the experience of God's true people. With the Catholic Church, which is God's fallen people. So what's the interaction? So you have people who are... Who are God's true bride, they're to God's true people, they're faithful. And they are not only living for the gospel, but they also are called martyrs or protestants. They're protesting the evil of the wicked church, the church, the group of people now who are once God's people who rebelled. And the result is that um, the, the church that was fallen or in rebellious state murdered killed, crucified, whatever you want to call it, the saints. So what was happening there? Well, in order for there to be a positive change, somebody had to sacrifice something. So, so, so somebody had to sacrifice their life. Somebody's blood had to be sacrificed. Somebody had to sweat. Somebody had to cry tears. Bible talk about weeping in the Old Testament between the porch and the altar. That was a general idea that was put forward that when evil is so much present that somebody often have to go between the porch and the altar between where the worshipers are and weep over it sometimes they would weep and you know what would happen similar to revelation seventeen six here is that their blood will be spilled because they will go and speak out but as they speak out that was the only method to effect change among human beings and so you find it in the Old Testament and the problem that sometimes I would look at it and say, well, why is it in the New Testament? Because after Christ died, you would think that there would no be no need for any more martyrs. But you realize because of rebellion, in order for positive change to effect, somebody has to be willing to say, I believe in this thing so much and I believe that a change needs to happen in such a serious way that I'm willing to sacrifice even my life for this change. And that was how change positively affect or, or it came into effect. Without this, you would not have any change because, again, you never hear about people say, well, you know, I went to a concert and it was a revival. You, you don't hear that. 
or I was at the park and we were, we were having a good time and all of a sudden, you know, we were there, you know, going for a hike or riding our bicycle and all of a sudden somebody break down and say, oh God, forgive me of my sins, you know, I, I just, just, you know, forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Normally you don't have a revival, you know, why people are on the, the roller, 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 roller coaster or at the theme park. Uh, that's not the place that you have positive change. Changes in a nation doesn't come in um, clubs. Changes in nations doesn't come in um, big party areas. The changes come um, when people are willing to put forward a principle and willing to stand behind that principle and literally willing to put forward blood, sweat, and tears to effect a change. Other than that, it doesn't happen. You see, this, you see it's... It's always others, um, the people that often cause them the trouble in the society and the failing society and even the failure in our, their personal life um, are not doing this at the expense of their life and their sweat and their tears. They're doing it at the expense of others. This is why evil push forward. See, sacrifice or, selfish or selflessness is always mine. But fun and games and wickedness is others somebody else is suffering i'm not suffering because it's not going to be my blood because if it's my blood then i'm going to be serious about it so that's the reality and this is where um the sacrifice of christ comes into more clear view why sacrifice because of sin because sin is always selfish sin is always about fun sin is always about me mine and 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 just all about my fun but when you want to bless others, you're going to give up something. You're going to give something towards that because now you're going to be inconvenient. And the sad reality, even to overcome our personal sins, in order for us to move forward, we have to be willing to sacrifice something. And this is why the way of the cross is the only way. The cross is not as how most people teach it, where they teach it that Jesus Christ died on the cross. It's just something that it does for us and we he just move around our business. No, he's showing us that that's the way. That's the way. This is why the moment Christ died, the disciples got it. They were willing to lay their life down for the principles that they believe in, to bless humanity. Because that's why they died. They died because they were willing to bless humanity. And they said we were willing to put our lives on the line for this. While before, they were willing to take other life. You know, to defend themselves at the risk of somebody else, so to speak. Fight. But the disciples got it in their minds. And when they got it, they said, no. If I have to die to be a blessing to others. If I have to die to teach people the truth of God to bless the poor, the fatherless, the widow. I'll do it. And when they did this, this was the reason why change could happen. So when you look at Revelation 17, 6, you say, well, what was the solution for the wickedness of this woman that was killing all the martyrs? Well, as you know, the history, the more the fallen church, the more the Catholic church kill the true Christian, is the more... The blood, they said, of the Christian. This is how normally I hear people say. They would say the blood of the Christians became like seed and became water to sprout forward new Christians. Because as they see, you know, people are willing to sacrifice it all for what they believe in. That was invigorated. And today it's no different. Where you see a person is willing to put everything on the line for what they believe in. It is motivating. There's nothing more motivating than that. A person who is willing to say, I'm willing to sweat for this. I'm willing to cry over this. I'm willing to lose my blood over this. or shed my blood over this. I'm willing to do this to bless others, not to take others' life. We're not talking about terrorism here because a terrorist is a person who is selfish. He does not really suffer. He dies in a flash of a bomb. No big deal. But if that same person and all the people killing other people would just say, I'm willing to suffer through, I'm willing to feel pain, to bless the society and the world, how much better this world would be to effect a change. 
I'm willing to work with my hands. You know, this Paul, God is so good. Paul says, look, I'll work with my hands, not only to support myself and to give me an opportunity to preach the gospel, but I'll even work with my hands so I can give money to those who are preaching the gospel so they can work full time and just dedicate themselves just to preaching the gospel to bless others. He got it and he shook the world. And when we get into this mindset, we affect changes in the world because we see that we're willing to put everything on the line so that a smile can be in a person's place, face, so that a person can feel comfort, so that a person can have some food to eat, so a person can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is worth it. So why sweat, why blood, sweat, tears um, for positive change? Is because that's the only way because it's never in selfishness and fun and giddy, ignorant, you know, mindlessness, you know, blissfulness. It is in the reality that says sin get us so caught up into selfishness that the only way to jerk a person who is a jerk out of selfishness is to jerk them by them beholding blood, sweat, tears. That's the only way. How many people are saved because they saw somebody literally die in front of them? And that bring them to the sense of that this world is not a playground. Somebody had to be sacrificed for them to wake up to some reality that it takes something else. How many people had to, um, in order for them to succeed against great odds, they have to be willing to, if they even have to sacrifice their life in order to make it, but they did it. And it is motivation for us because we look at it and say, I affirm that. I see this is what I need to do for me to make it because the odds that I'm up against, what I'm up against is so great that the only thing I can do is to sacrifice everything and put everything on the line. And so when you apply that to your personal experience, whether it be your job or whether it be your health or your mental well-being, the only way to overcome and get the success that you are deserving and you are so in need of is to lay everything on the line, is to willing to shed tears for that, is willing to feel pain, is willing to sweat, is literally willing to say, look, it's either I'm going to get this or I'm going to die. And when you get into that mindset, you'll get it. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 and 11, still looking at blood here. Look at Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 and 11. So whatsoever man there be that shall be of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourn among you, that eateth of um, any matter of blood, it I even set my face against that, that, that soul, that eateth blood, and will cut off from among the people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that make it atonement for your soul. So the blood is the thing that make atonement and bring us money to God. Um, here Christ is teaching him that, look, I don't want you to eat blood. I want you to look at blood so sacred and understand that it is the thing that make atonement for your soul. This thing here, the blood is very sacred. And so when you understand this, what Christ was trying to do here to Israel is teach them that I don't care who it is. It could be a stranger. It could be somebody born in your house. They can't eat blood. Blood has to be viewed in a very sacred way. It has to be have a very narrow use. Right? The use there was not just blood just to eat because I like the taste of it. Or blood just to eat because it gives me some nutrients or whatever. The blood was specific because the life of the flesh was in the blood. And when that blood was supposed to shed, that blood was supposed to be specifically shed just for the atonement of your sin. To atone you or to bring you back into oneness with God. That was a specific use. This is important when you consider this idea here that remember when Moses and the church of Israel left Egypt. The Lord taught them to become plant-based in their diet. So imagine if the only time blood would be shed is in the sacrificial system. After a while, it would seem gross and it would seem profound. Because all of a sudden, you're looking at the animal dying, you realize that animal is dying, 
and his blood is being shed so that I could have life. And that's the only way to deal with sin. The preciousness of the blood was supposed to be seen. So in other words, what I believe when it comes on to sacrifice, when it comes on to giving it your all, you don't give your all for wickedness. Um, that's what sin does. Sin make your you know life become you know just common and cheap. That's what sin does. Sin doesn't make life be precious. See, in the situation here, Lord was going to teach Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, Moses, and all the children of Israel that life is precious, even the life of the animal, and even much more the life of the human being, and beyond all of that, the life of Jesus Christ. So we have an appreciation for what true sacrifice is and what sacrifice is supposed to be made for. Because there's people, somebody say, yeah, I can apply the principles you're teaching, Lloyd, and I can apply it to, um, to say, try to make get rich by doing wicked wickedness. And it's true you can, but that would be the wrong way of using blood and sacrifice. Because you sacrifice and you're wasting your time. You don't want to waste your time. So here, this blood when it's shed wouldn't be a waste of time because it's shed for a very specific reason. Because you see what it takes to overcome sin. And you see how grievous sin is when you truly understand true sacrifice. See, people today, every day, sacrifice, and when they finish their lives, they look back. It wasn't worth it. But when you put out all your effort for atonement, and you're willing to bless, to be a blessing, to receive a blessing, and to give a blessing to the general society, that blood becomes valuable. And this is why the blood of the martyrs were so valuable. Because they were shedding their blood because they were trying to rob somebody and got killed. They were shedding their blood because they were trying to murder somebody and they got killed. They were shedding their blood because they were busy bodying people's business, got into arguments and got killed. They were shedding their blood for the betterment of humanity and for the upliftment of Jesus Christ. For truth to be preached so that the people can be free from the tyranny of darkness and evil institutions. See, that type of sacrifice is worth it and you see how precious life is. But a life that is shed, um, hamped up on drugs, overdose, on heroin, fighting for just to get rich, fighting for wealth, fighting or doing things just to get high, whatever it is, partying, taking risk, person shed his blood because he jumped off of the side of a cliff, because he's doing BASE, you know, jumping, base jumping. What happened? What was affected? Nothing. So here in this text, the Lord is saying, I want you to understand that life, blood, is precious. And you don't sacrifice it unless it's for atonement. It's to bring yourself or to bring others into oneness with Jesus Christ. You just don't sacrifice your life and your energy and your effort for garbage. You put it in there for something that's worthwhile. So without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And secondly here, that the atonement, the blood, the blood is given for the atonement to bring us back into oneness. For your soul and for the blessing of others. When Christ's blood was shed, it wasn't shedding it so we can be free um, to be fools. This was not the aim. To be part, you know, to be revelers and to be adulterers and backbiters and whoremongers and you know you know heresies and all that was not what christ died for christ died to bring us into oneness with with the father by giving his life as a ransom for the remission of sin so if a person is gonna die so to speak if blood is gonna be required if he's gonna do something where it's gonna be something make it be something for something good if you're going to sacrifice your life, don't sacrifice it for deep fried food. Don't sacrifice, you know, your, your life because you want to, you know, eat all the sugary cakes and you die early because your body was so riddled with diseases. Don't sacrifice your life for fornication. Don't sacrifice your health for any of these things. Your blood is much more precious. But if you put in for the sacrifice to be healthier, to 
bless somebody, to help somebody that is being oppressed, to help somebody that is um, can't get food to eat, then it's worth it because you're effecting positive change through blood, sweat, and tears or sacrifice. And that's what you want to do. Don't be crying over, over silly movies and crying over, you know, superstars. That's not what your tears are for. Your tears are for to cry over those who are suffering, to cry over those who are in need of the gospel. That's what your tears are for. That type of tear will affect positive change. Again, you never, I never, you're never going to find positive change coming out of a club. That's that never the case. When people come out of a club, the end result is more failure. So verse 11 again. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar for um, altar to make an atonement for you. For it is the blood that make it an atonement for the soul. It's the blood. It brings us into oneness. And again, when you see somebody's willing to die for what they believe in, that is beautiful. As long as it's for positive change. We see somebody's willing to go gangbang, shoot up a community, the drive-by killing. And they ain't sacrificing anything. They're just killing other people. They're sacrificing others. But it's potent when you see a person for positive good, to bring about righteousness, to bring about change, is willing to them to sacrifice themselves, not others, sacrifice them. Notice the Christian never went about trying to kill people to be a blessing. The Christian went about and willing in order to bless people who risk their lives as the martyrs of Jesus Christ who risk their lives and as they risk their lives to bless others, even the people that they're blessing could turn on them and kill them. And they were willing to do that to the people. Just imagine you're trying to bless somebody and you know that the risk is if you fail at blessing them that they could kill you. You say, I'm going to take that chance because if they receive the gospel, you know, the sacrifice, now it will be the sweat and the tears was worth it. If they don't, well, it's I, I, the effort is worth it. And I try to bless somebody and they turn on me and they kill me. That is the blood. And that is the preciousness. So when we look at Christ's blood, we see Christ didn't take nobody's life. Christ came, he healed the sick. He cleansed the leper. He cast out demons. He fed the hungry. He taught those that were ignorant. He gave the gospel and he gave his life ultimately to save us. That is what blood is meant for. That is what sweat is meant for. Tears are meant for. That is where you get good result. And we follow Jesus Christ because of this. And we see others doing everything to destroy others in order for them to either live comfortable or to win. Christ says, I'm willing to sacrifice my life. And as I say, the moment the disciples got this, you see the potency of what was being affected because all of a sudden you see how, wow, that's, that's influence, that's power. Because everybody want to preserve their life and ultimately lose it because the wage of sin is death. But the disciples got it and they said, so is that about me getting the highest place? I get in the next place next to Christ? It's about me willing to go the extra mile, to turn the other cheek, to stand up for what is right, to stand up for others, to bless others in order to effect change. This is what's needed. You show me the community right now that is under duress, is under darkness and death and destruction and violence, ignorance. And what simply is needed is some Christians, some followers of Jesus Christ who are willing to be martyrs or willing to say, I'm a teacher, but firstly, I'm a martyr. I'm willing to be a martyr, but I'm going to go in there and teach these people. I'm going to go in there and preach to these people. I'm going to go in there and feed these people and do whatever. And I'm willing to die doing it. And that's what will change that will effect a change. What we have in our society is that there's a lot of people who are willing to go kill their fellow human beings so that they can be the best. You can find a whole bunch of worthless young men who are willing to be rappers and rock and rollers to help destroy their society with filthy music and filthy words and lyrics. 
so that they can become number one while their society die around them. And they said they're just doing the game and they're just trying to build up themselves on the back of their fellow human beings. But what we're missing is young men who say, no, I'm willing to go in there and bless others at the risk of my life. I'm willing to go in there or willing to be in there because many times they're already there saying they're Christians. But you can't find Christians like this. It's like this that missing. I'm willing to put my head up and if the bullet hit me, it hit me. But I'm going to put my head up and say, stop. You all just need to stop and start to love each other. So if you look at this, you see this whole idea in life. As you know and well aware of that, the reality of our existence is that even after the death of the cross, that the, the animals still didn't stop dying. You know, death is just something happening if you don't do anything. You just, animals die. But, you know, after Christ died, we continue with a, with a animal-based diet, diet for the most part. So, if you're not plant-based eating, it's required that animals are sacrificed for you to live. Now, we would say that the animal life is less than the human life. Hence, human beings would say we sacrifice animals to live. Even if you're not sacrificing an animal, if you're don't, if you're not a vegan, plant-based eater, well, somebody is sacrificing an animal for you to live. I don't believe this is necessary. I think you can live every day without sacrificing animals. I believe the sacrifice of Christ covers all sac necessary sacrifice per se when it comes to animals and stuff. But anyhow, Christ died and we keep sacrificing animals for food. But as the Bible says, we were not created to sacrifice animals for food. But we see this as an example. I'll give you an example here, some examples as, you know, sacrifice keep going. And we would say the sacrifice of the animals is worth it because for, it's for the benefit of the human beings. We are supposed to eat grains or not grains but vegetable to get certain healing nutrients but some people say well let the animal eat the, the grass and then we eat the animal not the best thing it's just you go ahead and eat your lettuce so but this is one of the things here uh, another thing here almost all of our shoes for the most part they're synthetic material so it's even tell you that a lot of stuff that we do we still have to do it by sacrificing animals but anyhow um clothing shoes we still do it um, with animals. We do skin grafts with animals. And we do some valves inside of the heart with animal, animals. So I'm just saying here that the concept of sacrificing something for the greater good of others um, is still continue for the majority of human beings. Um, I think the largest percent of the, the people on the Earth's planet uh, sacrifice animals or eat animals to live without the shedding of the animal's blood, they would die, I guess, or they have to figure out how to eat grains and seeds and legumes. So when you look at this, um, the concept here that in order to have positive change or good, you still need something to be sacrificed. Again, if you decide, oh, look, I want to be a plant-based eater, you're going to sacrifice animals. In other words, you have to cut it out of your diet for positive good. You know, there are many people now realizing more and more that if they want to basically live their full life, whatever that is, um, healthier and with less pain, uh, it's just best to leave the animals alone. But even that re requires sacrifice. And sometimes it requires literal blood, sweat, and tears. In other words, you have to give a lot, you know, because you have to, your appetite is going to wreak havoc in your mind. Um, and that's just the reality. Um, we normally look at a person now, and I've said this before, who is like a fireman, uh, police, and so forth. And we think it is commendable that if they're willing to go into a dangerous situation to save somebody, that it's a good thing. We would normally um, give, you know, make probably name a street off of them, you know, give them some type of honor, special funeral if they die. Or we say, well, that blood was worth it. Because it's something good. So the, the concept never left our mind, in other words, that for greater good, you got to sacrifice something. It's part of our psyche and our thinking. And so it is, it, it is not something that is so far from our thinking. It's just that we kind of put it off because we don't want to see ourselves in that situation. We want to be the person that's giving the parade to the dead person. We don't want to be the person to be that dead person. But at the end of the day, 
that's just what life is, part of life. In order for there to be great and good, somebody had to say, I'm going to stop being a sinner. I'm going to live righteous. I'm going to sacrifice my lifestyle for the greater good of myself and ultimately for others. Somebody have to pick up the cross. Somebody have to deny themselves. And somebody have to follow Jesus. And that is what is so missing and needed in our society. So often we have in our society that, again, there's so many who are willing to sacrifice somebody else for the greater good, but they're not willing to say, you know what happened? Me. Let it be me, Lord. Somebody needs to do this. And when you get this in your mind, you realize this is what makes life worth it. If you want to be successful in whatever you're doing, and you felt like you have a sin problem, you have a health problem, you have a mental problem, and you can't seem to break through, the way to break through is literally through blood, sweat, and tears. And it will work. It's just going to come hard. And it's never easy. You're never going to have it easy because what it's going to have is going to cost you something. And you're going to see that, hey, look, in order to effect positive change, it's going to cost you something. And you could say, well, I'm not going to go that way. That's too hard. Well, if you don't go that way, you're going to go the way of everybody else. You're just going to keep sitting and keep expecting from others. And you're not willing to give of yourself. And so, we believe, I believe this. You want to be successful in business. You want to be healthier. Well, it's going to cause you some sweat, right? Because you're going to have to exercise. Uh, no matter how much raw you eat, no matter how much herb you eat, no matter how much healthy, vegan, um, plant-based, organic, as natural as possible food you eat, you're still going to have to exercise. You're still going to have to feel that burn. You're still going to have to sweat. It's still going to have to cost you something. And when it starts to cost you something, guess what happened? You prize the victory more because you know that victory came at a heavy cost. Those who don't value the victory are those who don't understand the price. As it is, the person who is doing the hard work, appreciate the results more than the person who never did it. They don't understand what goes in to get the result. So they don't understand and they never appreciate and celebrate and feel good about hard work because they just don't understand it. But when you have done it and you've bashed yourself on the hand while you try to get something done, when you have frozen your hands off, when you feel pain so much that you want to give up, when you just get discouragement, when, as I said, the worst situation to do is working with people who are working against you and are working against themselves and you're working to bless them. And that is so discouraging that you keep pressing forward. Then you start to understand a little bit of what Christ went through. And you start to appreciate blood, sweat, and tears. You start to appreciate why sacrifice. Why is it that you have to go so hard? And another person who never done that hard work, they just don't understand what it is. They don't understand what it is when you're tired and you want to give up and you say, I'm going to keep pressing forward. And then they're sleeping. They're not going to understand it. They're going to be like, why are, you, why are you so serious about this? Because that's the only way to effect positive change. And they say, I have no positive change in my life. That's your problem. If you want a positive change in your life, you're willing to put in something to get something out. And the, again, you never find a person who is just being hammered and beaten by sin and wickedness, and you know, and and they're they're pushing hard. It's normally people roll over and play dead. You roll over and play dead, devil come and bite you up. I you know most lion you think they're not gonna they go sniff and realize you're breathing and they just eat you. You better fight and you run and do everything to escape from that roaring lion, cause he gonna devour. And so I say the, 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 the way of the Christian is just constantly moving, constantly fighting, constantly pressing forward. Because if you're not pressing forward, there's something coming to eat you. And that's the reality. And so when you look at this, I want to read this with you. Um, this, is, um, this is Isaiah chapter um, 1, verse 10 through 18. I'll get back to the uh, text here. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10 through, 10 through 18 reads, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law for God, ye 
people of Gomorrah. Now, before I go into what it is, so think about it again. The Bible is very clear about Solomon Gomorrah. What was Solomon Gomorrah problem that developed? It? Solomon Gomorrah, as described by the Bible and the, the 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 minor prophets in the writing of Paul, Romans chapter one, is primarily because of becoming unthankful and becoming lazy, gluttony, idle, idleness. This is synonymous with failure. The vanilla ice cream lifestyle is what I call it. Uh, you know, when you, you get that vanilla ice cream lifestyle with some probably fudge and some sprinkles on the ice cream, somehow it tends to more sin and wickedness and failure. The life of Christ where you, you're you hard worker, you're diligent, you study, you, you, you understand what sweat and tears is all about, you understand what blood is all about, somehow that produces a positive good. The lifestyle, which is the vanilla ice cream lifestyle, it produces all these negative. It's a very weird thing. You go somewhere and there's too much unemployment, problems. I tell you, if I go somewhere, I don't matter where it is, and it is like 10 o'clock, it's 2 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and I didn't say 12 first because 12 could be lunchtime, but it's middle of the day, in other words, and there's a lot of young people on the road that are not high school age, they're older than high school age, and they're milling about, they're walking about, I'd be like, why, why are they on the road? They ain't supposed to be here, they're supposed to be working. And normally you can check the stats in the air like this, you're going to find that there's more deviant behavior, more drug problem, more crime problem, more violent prime problems. Because the devil find work for idle hand. Somehow the Sodomite and the Gomorrahite lifestyle produce more sin. So this is where one of the big problems, because people say people are just born that way. Um, probably they have some type of thought about certain things, but that lifestyle really pushes it on. And the Bible simply teaches in Romans chapter 1 that it becomes, they became silly and perverted because they're idle. So for a positive good period, because of sin, uh, we, we, we think that we can do wrong and get good. Uh, it is only through blood, sweat, and tears. We have to sacrifice something. We have to press hard. Hard work is a beautiful thing. So verse 11 says, To what purpose is a multitude of your sacrifice unto me, says the Lord? I am full of the burnt offering of rams and of fat of, um, fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lamb or of he goat. So here now is, as they say, a twist in the tail, because here... Um, the, the Bible says, um, the Lord on the inspiration through Isaiah saying here that the Lord can become tired of this type of thing. Now, this is a tricky, and I've observed this because there's a point where you, you gotta, you, the, they gotta be, remember, the blood is, has to be effective to work atonement, right? So, the blood of Jesus Christ can't can lose its power. <laughs> how does it lose its power? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 11. It loses its power when it becomes useless. In other words, the blood is supposed to bring atonement, positive change. You could have just sacrificed and blood, as I say, sweat and tear, and nothing is happening because it's being wasted. Have you heard somebody say, I don't want to eat that, or I don't want to eat now because I don't want to waste my exercise. You familiar with that? You don't waste the exercise. You could look to the cross of Jesus Christ and be a follower of Christ and still waste the sacrifice of Christ because it doesn't affect any positive change. Nothing happened. The blood is being spilled, um, you know, in vain. And so there could come a time, and there's been times where it just become useless. And a sacrifice and a martyr wouldn't work anything. Nothing would change. Somebody just watch the person die and be like, why, why did they do that? <laughs> it, it has to have its context and it has to have its meaning and it has to effect a change as it is for nothing. I'm sure you've seen, in the, I guess I'll give you an example, in a natural world where a person, in order for them to control their appetite and their weight, they go and binge, binge fast. They're just fast, 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 fast. They're constantly fasting. And they use the fasting as a methodology to control their weight. Instead of trying to figure out now that 
they do the sacrifice. In other words, to be a fast is like a sacrifice as blood and sweat and tears. And you do that, you lose the weight and you go through that discipline and that discipline teach you to control and learn self-control and control yourself. You, so this is why I believe Christ says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow him. So one has to understand that sacrifice in itself can be useless. You have to watch that. So remember, we're talking about why blood, sweat, and tears um, for positive change. It is important, but you have to make sure that your tears are not in vain. Your sweating is not in vain. Your blood is not in vain. Because again, I, as I explained, a person could put a lot of effort, a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, and even their blood for wickedness that will not effect a positive change. Again, I gave an example, the terrorists. That person there will put all the effort into killing themselves to kill others. What's going to change? Ain't nothing going to change. Ain't nobody going to get converted over watching somebody blow themselves to kill somebody. There's no context. There's no reason. There's no positive good. But you find a person who died because they were trying to push for the better, betterment of others, to uplift others, to give others better positive change. That's a sacrifice. That is how can effect positive change. So again, why, as I showed you in Leviticus, in the beginning of the presentation, that the Lord says the blood should not even be eaten by a Jew, was because that blood, they need to see when the animal died, they need to see it as precious. That blood was supposed to be revered because the, you could take the blood of animals and make it become useless. In Isaiah chapter 1, that's literally what happened. The blood of the animals became useless. So you have to understand is that says, again, make sure that when you're making a sacrifice, it's not a useless sacrifice. Not a useless sacrifice. Because the aim of blood, set and tears is for your positive good or for the society positive good. But uh, you can see people all day long, blood, set and tears to get something. Uh, and you say, what did they accomplish? I see it all the time. You, you, I give you an example in sports. You see people damage themselves, cripple themselves. And you say, well, why did they do that? And you can't really figure out why. You see people take punches in their head to become the heavyweight, welterweight, middleweight, lightweight, and they, till they, they die of some hemorrhages and stuff like that, and they die younger than they should. And you say, what, what positive good did that sacrifice effect? How did society move forward by the sacrifice of that man? Because that man really put in blood, sweat, and tears. A boxer, um, some of these MMA guy, where somebody could give you a kick, a roundhouse kick, and hit you at the back of their 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 heel, and bust your jaw open, break your jaw bone, and blood spilling everywhere, and you're gonna be damaged for the rest of your life. People with cauliflower ears. Somebody say, I earned that cauliflower ear. My ear looked like a ca cauliflower, and it's blood, sweat, and tears. Why? What was it accomplished? Was somebody fed from it? Was the world moved positively? So after a while, the sacrifice become meaningless. Now, I want you to think about this meaningless sacrifice before I keep reading the eyes here, that if you notice know even with some of the things like we call these terrorist bombing, that after a while, the society become numbs to it. Those that are being bombed away and those that are doing the bombing. Because it's just meaningless. It's just really war. People are just killing each other for just sacrificing other people's life for no reason. Nothing's going to affect of it. The person that's killing people, their side is not going to become more righteous and holy and kind and richer and more healthy and more happy and more vibrant and life is better for everybody always in, say, the Muslim society and community, even the extreme version parts of it. You don't get to become a better person because you see a fellow human being kill other people. And those who are being killed... Nothing change because they're still going to be secular. They don't change their hearts. What does that do for you? Somebody blow you up for no reason. You don't even know where you're being. You don't even know why you're being blown up. That sacrifice is useless. And that's what it is like in a lot of things in life. Somebody give a sacrifice so they can be a prostitute, so they can be a pimp, a drug dealer, a gangbanger, a, a Wall Street 
um, robber baron, a pirate on the seas over there and wherever in the world. And they sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears. Die doing it. What change happened? You see it all the time when people pull together to make a person in society a multi-millionaire. That doesn't lift the society up in lottery. We all come together and, uh, and uh, how many millions of us decide to put to together some money to make somebody a super millionaire so they can buy yachts and live better. How does that improve society and a lot of all the lottery ticket buyers? And how does even improve the life of the person that wins? Because normally it becomes a curse in their lives because now all that sacrifice that people sacrifice their hard-earned money to make them a multi-millionaire, they become just, you know, just debauchery, all kind of debauchery in their practice and they just become filthy. So not every sacrifice is worthy. This is why the Bible is very clear that the sacrifice has to be for the atonement of blood. As the blood shed is useless. It has no value. And remember, Christ died for the sins of this world, but it's only for the Christian who have accepted him and allowed that, that blood that was shed 2,000 plus years ago to cleanse them from sin and give them atonement, bring them into oneness with God. Other than that, the sacrifices have no value to the person or another person because it doesn't do anything. It's just as this man died on the cross. I don't know why. It doesn't do nothing for them. Sacrifice is useless. You have a person, you know, I, I see they have one of the struggles, they have one of these, what you call the moral dilemmas in our society where you have a heart and the person next on the list is a gangbanger or the person in the hospital and he needs a heart, tra heart transplant or a liver transplant because he got a bullet through it. Are you thinking, do you give it to somebody that's worthy or give it to this person so they can get back in the street and go kill more people? Those are moral dilemmas because you feel like the sacrifice that a person who died and the family member is giving up that, 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 that organ is wasting their time. Because the person is going to go out there and go kill more people. You're, you're saving the life of a person to kill. Doctors go through these things. And if you notice, like places like Chicago, they have shut down many of the, the hospitals and emergency rooms in the roughest areas because they're too expensive. And the society doesn't see it as being valuable to put a multi-million dollar hospital, could even be in the billions over the years, um, to have an emergency room, room to patch up gangbangers or you're just patching them up so they can go back to war. Remember the reason why God himself, is a similar idea why God himself took away the tree of life. Because he, you were just going to give in eternal life to people to kill to kill other people. And to be murderers or rapists and thieves. So there's a point where the ways of sin is dead. Let them die. Because this is going to continue perpetuating life. The atonement, the sacrifice of others don't mean anything to them. So you imagine the doctor working overtime just to patch up somebody that he's going to have to work in again probably a few months later. And these are moral dilemmas that uh, the doctors, let them die. Shut the hospital down. Get out of there. They want to kill each other. Let them wipe each other out. They're just balancing. It's like you need lions and hyenas to balance out nature. So they just balance each other out. So you can, so they're sacrificing each other, but it doesn't do no positive good. So I just wanted to point it out. So make sure that whatever sacrifice you're making, somebody say, I'm sacrificing something for my child. You could be wasting your time. That sacrifice ain't do nothing for that child. The, 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 because it's not appreciated and not, not understood. This is why the gospel has to be preached because the person has to understand why the sacrifice. A child, a five-year-old child, sees somebody baptized and say, I want to be baptized. They don't understand why. Rarely could they. So when we go to verse 12, it says, When you come to appear before me, who oh, I require this at your hand to tread my courts, and when you spread your forth your hand, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear, for your hands are full of blood. So they're sacrificing something. Were you related down? We're not going to have time to do that now. But were you related on in the passage? You find out they were sacrificing the poor people. They were sacrificing the innocent. And did that break any positive good in Israel? They became darker and more violent than the Lord after bringing a pagan nation to wipe them out. And to bring them captive to stop the madness. So blood was being shed, but the blood was again was the blood was not precious. It was just in vain. They were just killing people to cause the society to get worse. 
uh, there's many people right now, as I say, in some of the roughest parts of the world, that all they do, they sacrifice their fellow human being for their own good, for their selfishness, and they denigrate and bring down the society. And what the world needs is Christians to go in, to be in, and to be a Christian that is willing to lay their life, their sweat, their tears on the line to lift up society. We have enough superstars and heroes and movie stars in our society and sports stars that just sacrifice everything to destroy society. So simple, the Bible says, verse 16, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason, says the Lord. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So when you think about this, the Lord says, I can wash you. I can make you clean. But not the methods you're doing it. I want you to put away the evil. That's going to take some sacrifice. Learn to go do good. That's going to take something of you. And when you do this, you find that says the positive good in your life will come. What do you want in this life that is positive? What do you pray for for the Lord to bless you with? That's positive. You will have it. But the Lord is going to tell you, it's yours. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow me. That's what the world need. The world need cross people who are deniers of self. The world need people who are going to pick up the cross and they're going to follow him. And this will effect a change. I'm going to read another concept here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. So if we can just slip this through. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. We had to see the sacrifice of Christ as valuable because the bulls, after a while, they become invaluable. We're like, ah, that's a bull, that's a lamb, that's a whatever being died. See, normally the value is always when you see somebody's blessing others. As I say, a person that's a terror to the society get killed. It's even sad when they get killed and they get killed in ways that are illegal, but then people are like, yeah, what's a big deal? Normally, it's the elevated concept. The person is elevated. So a person who is in the society trying to teach the society, trying to feed the society, trying to um, bless the society, living a righteous life, doing good so that others can be uplifted instead of being selfish. You know, you think about it, all these mega church pastors and these pastors that are multi-millionaires that is taken from society and you don't see the positive good and the members of the congregation are sacrificing and with the hope that he's going to bless but you don't see the blessing what happened is it's not working with christ christ came and christ was positively good and was working to uplift the society the evil religious leaders who are like the modern day mega church prosperity gospel preachers worked everything to do to kill him but when they killed him, what it is, it fueled, it fueled his disciples to be positively a blessing to society, to be martyrs themselves for the upliftment of society. And this is what kept the gospel going through the dark ages. And as we are coming up on a time where we're in a time where darkness is engrossed in the world, where we see just people kill, destroying their own fellow human being, destroying all societies, infecting societies with their filthy video games and their filthy music, music and the movies and all the filth that people put out to enrich themselves so that others can be sacrificed and mess up others' lives. We need more and more Christians to embrace the sacrificial martyr's life that they're going to say, Jesus is it. I, I'll go, I'll take the gospel and I'm going to sacrifice all that I can, all that I have in order to bless others, blood, sweat, and tears, so that others can be uplifted. This is what we need, not the selfishness. Our Father, who art in heaven, we pray that you may continue to bless us. Pray, dear Lord, that you may continue to be with us, that we might be like Jesus. May you forgive us of our sins. May you cleanse us, dear Lord, from all filthiness of the flesh and all selfishness. 
And may we live to love and bless. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive for Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow morning where we do the importance of church. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King.